Paula Julie Abdul was born the second of two children in San Fernando, California on June 19, 1962, to a French-Canadian mother and a Syrian Jewish father. She began taking ballet, tap, and modern dance lessons around the time her parents divorced when she was seven. She would feel inspired towards a career in the entertainment business after seeing Gene Kelly in the 1952 musical romantic comedy film, Sing in the Rain. But while Paula was expanding her dancing skills and learning the basics of choreography, she never gave up the idea that she might also be a singer. I'd always admired Liza Minnelli. She can dance and sing. I wanted to be one of those Broadway type performers who could do it all. While attending high school, she also picked up cheerleading, a skill that she would later parlay into a career. After graduation, Paula did put in some time at California State University Northridge, but never finished after a great opportunity presented itself. During her freshman year, she was selected from a pool of hundreds of candidates for the cheerleading squad of the Los Angeles Lakers basketball team, the famed Laker Girls. Within a year, she became head choreographer and remained with the team for six years. She was discovered by the Jacksons after a few of the band members had watched her while attending a Laker game. Paula signed on to do the choreography for an upcoming music video for them, which then led her to choreographing several of their sister Janet's videos for her 1986 album, Control. Those results tremendously boosted Paula's career, who'd now become a well sought after video choreographer, going on to create moves for various artists like ZZ Top, The Pointer Sisters, and Duran Duran. She even won an Emmy for her choreography on The Tracy Ullman Show. Paula also took her skills to the big screen, choreographing sequences for the giant keyboard scene involving Tom Hanks' character in Big, as well as the wedding scene in Coming to America. Even though she was achieving a lot of success doing her thing in the dance world, Paula had even bigger dreams. She met with the co-managing directors at Virgin Records and announced her intentions to them. She said she could sing and wanted to do an album. They were already familiar with her through her work on music videos and figured since she already had a great personality, the looks, and superb dance skills, if she could sing too, she could definitely be a star. So using her own money, she went into the studio and cut a demo. The next thing Paula knew, she was signing a deal with Virgin Records. Paula's debut album, 1988's Forever Your Girl, would reach number one on the Billboard 200 and set a record for the most singles from a debut album to grab the top spot on the Billboard Hot 100, beginning with Straight Up. In the music video, popular late night talk show host Arsenio Hall is seen making a cameo, sparking rumors that the two were an item. However, in a 1990 interview with People Magazine, Paula made the truth abundantly clear. Arsenio and I are close friends, and I have an extreme fondness for him, but there's nothing, absolutely nothing intimate going on. In fact, around this time, Paula was seeing full house actor John Stamos. He even went as her date to a Virgin Records party, as well as the Grammys. Forever Your Girl became a slow burning success, only after it had almost been written off as an irredeemable flop. Straight Up was actually the album's third single and the first to make a splash on the charts. Knocked Out and The Way That You Love Me that came before it didn't even crack the top 40. Straight Up was so popular that it pretty much single-handedly helped the album to finally capture the number one spot 64 weeks after it debuted on the chart. It eventually went seven times platinum and gave Paula her first Grammy for Best Music Video for Opposites Attract. No matter the level of success the project attained though, Paula still had to deal with some criticism. One of the main ones was about her voice. At the time, L.A. Reid and Babyface, two of several producers tapped to work with her on her debut, were on their way to peak popularity and really had no patience for having to spend a lot of time fiddling around in the studio to get things to sound right. In L.A.'s memoir, he even said that it took a long time to record her vocal. In addition, it's also been said that they actually kicked her out of the studio after a while to finish working on it without her. Her image though was something everyone could get behind. A sweet personality, a warm smile, and exotic good looks. That last quality would end up being an interesting topic of debate and confusion. Paula's dark features, skin tone, and urban sound provided just enough ethnic vagueness for her to pass as just about anything. When asked by the LA Times what was she most often called, she said, maybe black because of the music. I sing R&B, music, dance music, that's aimed at the black audience. They think I'm one of them. 
People tell me all the time, I'm glad to see another sister making it. Then suddenly, as Paula was enjoying her success, a dark cloud moved in. In 1991, a singer and former member of R&B soul funk girl group, Mary Jane Girls, Yvette Marine, filed a lawsuit against Paula and the Virgin label, alleging that it was her vocals that were used on several tracks from Paula's album. Her claims were that at least two songs on the album, Opposites Attract and I Need You, the lead vocal track was a composite of two distinct voices, Paula's and hers. She did sing all of the lead vocals. No one ever said that she didn't. I'm just saying that I know that my guide vocal was definitely used as well. Yvette told the LA Times, All I'm asking for is what's fair. I'm not saying Paula didn't sing. I just want credit given where credit's due. We both sang lead, and I feel Virgin ought to give me proper billing and pay me appropriately for my supporting vocals. In the end, a jury sided with Paula, and the label rejected Yvette's claim to credit and copyright compensation. Paula's successful run in the 80s continued on into the 90s with her second album, 1991, Spellbound. The project produced two number one singles, Rush Rush and The Promise of a New Day. The third single, Blowing Kisses in the Wind, also became a top 10 hit, and the album's other releases, Vibology and Will You Marry Me, broke the top 20. Spellbound ultimately went three times platinum, but that was a far cry from the numbers her debut put up. Paula would then take a break from music and focus more on her personal life. She married actor Emilio Estevez in 1992, after six months of dating. They would split two years later. Paula would be the one to reveal that the reason for their divorce was that she wanted children and Emilio, who already had two from a previous relationship, did not. While Paula was dealing with the end of a marriage, she was also receiving treatment for a disorder she'd been privately suffering from for a long time. Years later, she would finally open up about her battle with bulimia nervosa that began when she was a teenager. I'd starve myself, then binge, then purge. Whether I was sticking my head in the toilet or exercising for hours a day, I was spitting out the food and the feelings. After a four-year hiatus, Paula released her third album, Head Over Heels, in the summer of 1995. The lead single, My Love Is For Real, performed well on the dance chart, where it reached number one, and made it into the top 30 on the Hot 100. Overall, the album only saw moderate commercial success and would later become her lowest selling release. Love was in the air again and Paula would take another trip down the aisle when she married clothing designer Brad Beckerman in 1996 after meeting on a blind date eight months earlier. Sadly, they would divorce the very next year after just 17 months of marriage, citing irreconcilable differences. She also made a fresh start with her music career, leaving Virgin and signing a new deal with Mercury Records in 1997. While there were initial reports that she was working on new material, the following year, the Island slash Def Jam Music Group acquired Mercury and opted to drop several artists from their roster, including Paula, before she could complete her next album. In 2002, she began appearing as one of three judges on the Fox reality singing competition series, American Idol. Little did Paula know that this new chapter in the reality TV world would give her career an amazing resurgence that would last for many years. Things seemed to be going very well for her in the job until a shocking news report about her conduct with one of the contestants came to light. In May 2005, ABC's Primetime Live reported claims by season two American Idol contestant Corey Clark that he and Paula had had an affair during that season. He said the reason he didn't own up to the May-December relationship right when it happened was because he didn't want to have to rely on his association with her to further his music career. Clearly, he changed his mind, and according to him, for good reason. He claimed Idol producers conspired against him to ruin his career, blackballed him, and spread falsehoods about him throughout the music industry ever since his departure from the show that was reported to be due to his criminal past. Corey, though, says he was really sent packing due to making waves behind the scenes. Not surprisingly, some speculate that he's timed this reveal to help with the sales of a CD and new tell-all book. When asked if he ever loved Paula, Corey says he did. There was love there. It was a relationship for like three, four months. She told me she loved me. I told her I love her. Do I still love her? No, I've moved on. Do I love her as a person? Yes. Do I care about her? Yes. As for whether it bothers him that for the rest of his career, he'll be known as that dude who allegedly slept with Paul Abdul, he expressed confusion by the notion that it would. 
What's wrong with that? What would you have done if she hit on you? If you were my age and Paula, fine ass duel was hitting on you, what would you do? For the most part, Paula refused to comment on Corey's allegations, while Fox launched an investigation. Ultimately, it was found that his claims could not be substantiated. Right around this time, Paula disclosed that she'd been diagnosed with a neurological disorder causing chronic pain, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or RSD. She discussed the diagnosis in response to allegations of drug use as the result of what some described as erratic behavior by her during episodes of American Idol. She added that she was now pain-free following treatment with anti-inflammatory medication. Allegations arose again, though, a couple of years later, when videos circulated online of Paula appearing to sway in her chair and slur her speech during a set of interviews. So tell us, what are you looking forward to this season? <laughs> How about a lot of you coming in? <laughs> it's, a, it's a wild party where you are. You know what? They said, listen, any publicity is good publicity. You got to learn to eat it up and, and embrace it. Her publicist attributed this to fatigue and technical difficulties during the recording of the interviews. When Paula spoke to Ladies Home Journal in 2009 and posed as cover girl for their June issue, she had no idea that the interview would turn out the way it did. The article stated that she checked into a rehab clinic to help kick her painkiller addiction. That was it. Paula had had enough of the gossip and immediately issued a statement refuting the story. I want to make it perfectly clear to everyone that I have never been addicted to or abused drugs in my life. I have never been drunk. I have never entered a rehab or detox treatment center. After being on American Idol for several years, Paula took on her own reality show called Hey Paula that centered around her day-to-day -day life. It only lasted for one season. That very well could be attributed to how much her behavior on the show was criticized by audiences and even fellow celebrities. She was frequently shown in an unflattering light, belittling assistants, throwing tantrums, and consumed by emotional fits, crying uncontrollably about how the media had targeted her. <laughs> Go with it. <laughs> You know you like that. Hey guys, please, I'm trying to tell a goddamn story! She returned to the music charts for the first time in over a decade with the single Dance Like There's No Tomorrow in 2008. Its moderate success led to reports of Paula beginning work on a new album, but it never happened. That same year, a 30-year-old woman named Paula Goodspeed was found dead in her car, parked near Paula's Los Angeles home in Sherman Oaks, California. Her death was later reported to be the result of her taking her own life by a drug overdose. Goodspeed was an obsessive fan, having legally changed her name to Paula, drawn many pictures of her, sent her flowers, and also auditioned for Paula on season five of American Idol at a stop in Austin, Texas, before being dismissed from the show. Even though Goodspeed had been accused in the press of being a celebrity stalker, her relatives disputed the claim. As a result of stalled negotiations between Paula and the powers that be at American Idol, she decided not to return at the end of season eight. It was reported that she'd been earning as much as $5 million per season, and that she was reportedly seeking as much as $20 million to return. She claimed though her departure from Idol was not about money, but that she had to stand on principle. Her presence on reality TV wouldn't end there, however, and she would go on to serve as judge, mentor, and coach on various other dance and singing focused shows. Paula joined New Kids on the Block and Boys to Men on their Total Package Tour in 2017, making it her first tour in 25 years. No doubt inspired by that experience, she announced the following year that she would embark on a solo headlining tour across North America, titled Straight Up Paula, as part of the celebration for the 30th anniversary of her debut album. Then Vegas came calling. In August 2019, Paula began her first residency at the Flamingo Las Vegas. During the show, fans would get an earful of a crazy experience she had back in 1992 that not many had heard about until then. In her mid-show monologue, Paula revealed that she was in a plane crash during her Spellbound tour that required 15 cervical surgeries and led her to living in near constant agony for years. To be fair, when asked about her time away from the spotlight, Paula did discuss the emergency crash landing in a few early to mid-2000s interviews, but until recently, she didn't want to talk about it too much, because she said it took her a long time to build the career that she had, 
and she didn't want people thinking that she wasn't up to the challenges that come along with the pursuit of success in the entertainment industry. But in the last year or so, as she's become more outspoken about her injuries and recovery, some gossip sites have claimed that the story is an entire fabrication. Paula shrugged off the accusations, telling Yahoo Entertainment, you know what? It's like there are seven other people that were on the plane who were in that plane accident with me, so I really don't care what people have to say. I don't. After 13 years, Paula finally returned to American Idol in 2021 as a guest judge, while current judge Luke Bryan recovered from COVID. In early 2023, Paula stated that she is in talks to make her biopic. The dancer, choreographer, singer, actress, and TV personality said she's been wooed by a string of streamers and being offered big name directors and writers to tell her story of going from professional cheerleader to international pop star and reality TV icon.